Oh, definitely come in person. Oh my gosh, no. If you have the option to go to a conference, go in person. That's the whole point of conferences. All right, I think we're right at time. So hello everyone, my name is Mike Shaw. Welcome to the uh, talk, the factory pattern. It is labeled under back to the basics um, in a sense, but it's part of the software design track. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a moment. Um, all right, so here's the abstract that hopefully got you interested in this pattern and drew you in here. That's what we're gonna be talking about today. And just as a reminder, all the code for my presentations is gonna be up on GitHub. And I know since the slides might be hard to see for some folks uh, attending today, uh, I'm gonna put the slides up there right away as well. So who am I? Uh, in brief, Mike Shaw. Primarily, I teach at Northeastern University. I do some consulting, and you can read about me on my uh, webpage as you uh, like. And today's gonna be an interactive session, so feel free to shout out answers. I'm gonna try to uh, get some participation. Uh, folks are uh, online as well. I'll we'll look forward to your participation and for future folks watching on YouTube, uh, comment and like below or dislike if you dare. <laughs> um, so this was a question I was just actually asking folks at the conference uh, earlier and I was just sort of curious, how did folks get started in programming? What sort of piqued their interest? Anyone in the audience? Video games. Video games. Okay. Anybody else? My brother just wanted to see if I could learn some programming. A brother wanted to see if he could learn programming, a challenge. <laughs> Great damage. <laughs> Robotics. Robotics. Very cool. So a wide variety of domains here. Okay. Um, so, you know, just to throw me out there, uh, it was video games uh, for me. Of course, that was uh, my interest back in the day. Spent a lot of time playing them, and then I was interested in, well, how do you make them, how do you break them, and you know, how do you do all this cool stuff? So that was largely my motivation in uh, getting started to program. And for this talk, though, you know, I don't really care if you like games. That's totally fine, um, or if you don't know anything about them. But I do think they are gonna be an interesting use case for us to look at in terms of this pattern and thinking about a real-time system. That is something that has to process fast, something that's very dynamic in nature, something that's changing. Uh, I think video games are a nice uh, domain we can walk through. So, and just to sort of illustrate this point, uh, on the right here, I've got uh, a screenshot of Command and Conquer, which is a video game uh, in the 90s. And again, we don't have to understand what's going on here, but there is a lot going on. There's vehicles moving around, there's you know, objects being created, destroyed, uh, there's artificial intelligence. So there's a lot of stuff going on in games that makes them you know, relatively interesting when it comes to the challenge for uh, software architecture. So for today's talk, I want us to think about software design and specifically for this real-time application. The, the pattern that we're gonna be talking about is applicable in many domains, but I'm gonna think about it in sort of a video game context. So my expectation, and again, why this talk exists, I mentioned as part of this sort of back to basics track, but also in the uh, software design track, uh, Klaus and I have put together a sort of software design track to spread some knowledge about software architecture uh, Klaus getting a lot of credit for the work uh, this year, and uh, we wanted to have some sort of tutorial-like or back to the basics material for this, so covering different patterns. So something for folks to think about in the future or look out for uh, these sort of design pattern uh, talks. So this probably isn't an expert level talk for folks who have um, read some of the famous books like The Gang of Four, but uh, I'd encourage your wisdom in the audience if you do see things that jump out or that you'd like to share. And otherwise, it might be interesting to hear your insights on uh, the different trade-offs with this pattern. So the design pattern of today is, well, most of you have seen the title, but I'm not gonna spoil it just yet. <laughs> so let's think about what our goal is uh, in our domain here, in our video game. Uh, and you know, largely, I'm just gonna say that this is a user-driven application. A player's controlling the game, they're making decisions, they're creating objects, destroying them, uh, and so on. 
So my question uh, to the audience is if I have a user-driven application and part of that game uh, is that the user gets to create objects. You can see in this uh, animation plan on the right there, clicking on the user interface and then creating some building here. Uh, how well do you think as a developer I can predict what a user is gonna do at compile time? Meaning, you know, how many objects are they gonna create? Um, what are they gonna do? What types of objects? What do folks think or are thinking about? Not very, I, I see head shakes, nope. Uh, yeah, especially in a game that's very dynamic, right? You're gonna get lots of different people who play games in different ways or bend the rules or, uh, you know, games again are very dynamic. But, you know, with this in mind, I wanna walk you through uh, my sort of uh, thought process here. And we could try this, right? This seems like a reasonable thing to try just to take a guess. And, you know, maybe some of us like this. Sometimes in games, we actually do like this to sort of pre-allocate or figure out ahead of time how many objects we're gonna have. So in this slide, what I'm showing here, I have object type one, two, and three. And I've named them units one, two, and three, and there's 100 units each, okay? And, you know, 100 feels like a good number. Maybe I have some intuition about what happens in the game. I can think that's enough. Um, you know, maybe we could restrict somebody who's playing the game from having more than 100. Uh, maybe reallocate, that could be an option if they go over that limit. Uh, any thoughts on folks? What do they think about this? It's good to have a maximum so that they don't overflow your memory. Yeah, it is good to have a maximum here. So we do have a cap or some notion of that. So that's probably some constraint uh, we're gonna wanna enforce um, somewhere. I like that. Um, but some thoughts um, for video games, just in our domain, you know, these objects could be very large um, depending on what data they're holding or how much information. So if we're allocating hundreds of them, maybe we're okay in this system, but you know, maybe we're gonna have too much uh, stuff on our stack here, in our stack memory. You know, maybe we're doing this in the main function, maybe another function elsewhere. Uh, so we do have to be a little bit careful with some of these numbers. And maybe that is how we sort of figure out our upper bound, but you know, maybe we wanna you know, use a different um, piece of our memory, right? And dynamically allocate so that this will be located on the heap. So you know, we can, again, start off with 100 units and I can try to resize this if the you know, player goes over the limit. Uh, what do folks think about this? So let's say someone breaks, you know, they're playing the game, they're really good and they create more than 100 units. They're, they're up towards, you know, a thousand or something. What might be the problem in a game? A couple of things. So, so the comment is we have to wait and resize because we're growing our collection. Yeah, so the second thing, uh, the comment is, as we're doing this copy, right, because they're in flux and information's being copied, we're halted or blocked on that operation, in a sense. So that's kind of a problem, whether we're uh, increasing or decreasing, and of course, this is some sort of O of N operation. Very likely it's an O of N operation. Maybe there's some trick we can do, but uh, this is expensive, whether we're increasing or decreasing our size. So, Let's kind of get rid of that so I don't have to manage the resizing. And we have data structures to do this, right? We have std vector, um, perhaps other collections that might be appropriate. So let's just pack everything into a vector. That gets a little bit around this problem. You know, we're still resizing and doing things, but it's a more flexible container. Now, what if halfway through, again, I'm a game developer, I'm building this game, and then I decide, well, you know, object type three, we just don't like that. It doesn't make the game fun. We don't have time to ship that extra feature with this type of object. Well, what happens is I have to delete it everywhere. So I've just got these types that are also hanging around here. So I also don't like that part of this uh, design as well. And okay, so I've gotten rid of object type three. I've just got my two different object types. 
and they've each got their vectors where I'm gonna collect the units so everything's um, sort of together. But, you know, how am I, again, going to create these objects? Now I'm keeping track of different vectors where I'm pushing objects, I, I still have that obligation. And maybe I wanna create uh, this object type one here with no constructor, the default constructor, and object one here with a different constructor with two parameters. Okay, so now I'm making some decisions, and again, maybe that's okay, and I'm trying to figure this out, but um, it's getting a little bit complicated here in this code. And we can imagine if I'm trying to do this ahead of time before the game's built, um, you know, to, to sort of uh, set the user up for the game plan experience. So, you know, am I able to guess at compile time which to use? Maybe, maybe I have some control over that, but again, this is uh, a user doing something uh, very uh, dynamically. So instead what I'm gonna do is try to fix this by you know, pushing some of this work into a function. This is something that I'm gonna repeat, creating multiple uh, objects and then pushing them into some container uh, data structure. So I've got this function here, it's called make object one and push to vector. Uh, I'm very explicit about my names here <laughs> for the purpose of this talk, uh, but that takes in our vector, we're passing in by reference. Uh, so we were careful to do that for performance and it takes some parameters, maybe the X and the Y position of something in the game where it's located. Okay, and then we can handle that. Okay, so that's a little bit better. And, you know, maybe I can generalize this a little bit. Um, and certainly I can have parameters. Uh, maybe there's different parameters, but I also have to kind of update these and keep track of them. And again, I have to be careful with how I'm passing my collections in. If I pass this in without the reference, then I'm passing by copy, and that's potentially very expensive. But we are getting closer to something interesting here where I'm trying to abstract out this idea of creating my objects here. So I've got a function here that's called make object, and it takes a parameter int for the object type. Okay, so maybe I've got different, you know, airplanes, cars, vehicles, and those have a different number associated with them. Okay, so I can kind of parameterize how these functions are being created. And then maybe I've got some params here. I don't know what they are, um, but you know, int param one, int param two, and maybe some of them are used for some object types, maybe not for the others. And the audience is squinting a little bit at this <laughs> and sort of nodding their head and saying, what's going on? Um, or they can't see uh, the slides. Um, but, you know, we've also made some other sort of weird decisions here where I've, um, or, or I have, as I'm just thinking about this problem of moving our vector out to some sort of global structure where we can keep track of things. Um, so, you know, I, I still don't like this. It works. Um, you'll be able to run my code. Uh, but in a way, it's sort of like the ostrich saying it works, and then they kind of dip their uh, head into the sand and say, but I'm not going to look at it. You know, it compiled, I'm leaving. <laughs> so, you know, this is a practical solution that uh, works, or I shouldn't say it's practical, but uh, am I done here? And how do I know when I'm done? Is this a good piece of code? What's our audience think? Pardon? It's a judgment call. A judgment call. Okay, um, so that's a comment. What kind of things might I be uh, judging on? Yeah, so some of the comments uh, when the release is, right? If the release is tomorrow, maybe I don't care, this is good enough. Uh, the second was uh, a hint about, do I have to maintain this code? Uh, do I have to test this code? Uh, so those would certainly be important things, and that's where we're uh, gearing towards, uh, of course, here. Um, so, you know, I can give us some uh, sort of uh, three criteria um, for when I think a, a piece of code is uh, good. There is sort of a notion of good enough, right? This is economically driven. That was another one of the, the comments, right? So if the deadline uh, hits, maybe we're good enough. Um, but I like to sort of think about code that I write and that it's flexible, maintainable, and extensible. Uh, not terms that I've made up. I've borrowed these. I'll show you where I've borrowed them in a moment. Um, but if I sort of look at this code and evaluate it, uh, does anyone have any thoughts that this is is this flexible code? Is it maintainable? Is it extendable? Could I add other different object types to it? I thought, yeah. Uh, one thing I don't like is that uh, all of the parameters for any of the object types must be passed in, and most of them are no-offs. 
Yeah, so the comment was, most of these, I always have to pass in some parameters. And in the case, uh, case number two here, where I'm creating this new object that doesn't even use them, I'm essentially, it's a, it's a no-opt, right? We're wasting computation here. Well, it's, not, it's not very extensible because you'll have to continue adding parameters. Yeah, and it's not extensible. So we kind of fail that check here, right? Because if I add object uh, type three and it happens to take eight parameters, um, or a string or something that isn't just an integer. <laughs> so we probably want to work around that as well. Yeah, so I think it's it's kind of failing there. Maybe we can work around it, but uh, any other thoughts? And I'm going to be pretty generous with this code. Let's, let's see. Uh, so I've given, um, and again, you don't have to read this wall of text, but red is kind of a, a fail here. So we've sort of failed flexibility, failed maintainability and extensibility. Well, I was generous. I, I said, we can add more object types, <laughs> but we do have to you know, do some work here. Um, so on the flexibility, right, we can sort of extend our object types. Uh, the parameters, as was mentioned from the audience, is sort of a, a problem. Maybe we can have specific object param types that we're passing in, but this is sort of getting very uh, nasty <laughs> code to, to um, you know, it, it's not very flexible. We have to keep track of a lot of things. Uh, is it maintainable? Well, again, probably not, right? If I remove an object type or I change a data structure, I'm diving into this code and, you know, was it two that equals equals object type or, you know, was it something else or, you know, so we could have gaps here. It's probably not robust code. What if a user passes in a thousand as the object type and it doesn't exist? Uh, they just get no object, no warning. So. I'm generous, I'm gonna give this a, a one out of three. Um, because it's my code, I give myself one point. <laughs> um, so the problem that we're trying to solve here, um, or at least my claim is, if I have a user-driven application, a game, something that's very dynamic, uh, one, it's gonna be very difficult to figure out how to create objects of different types, right? We've tried to do that with passing in uh, integer values as a parameter, and again, that's, that's hard to sort of predict. Uh, we will revisit this point um, uh, by the end. Um, and then it can also be difficult to figure out where to create the objects. Am I just doing this in a bunch of free functions? Does it happen in my main? Um, so those are some design decisions that I have to think about and, and commit to and be convinced that it's extensible, flexible, and maintainable. And again, any of these problems that I'm looking at, we usually want to consider them at scale. So not just two different object types, but what if I have hundreds or thousands? Okay, so again, let's think about this game just looking at it here. Again, we don't really have to understand what's going on other than there's a lot of different units moving around here, different objects uh, in the game, and we're able to create an undefined amount here. So what's the right pattern here? How do we solve this here? Okay, well, luckily, uh, there's been some smart folks well, well before me who <laughs> have figured out some patterns to help us, uh, and these are called design patterns. So I'm gonna give a quick uh, rundown of what that means. Uh, but design patterns are templates or flexible blueprints for developing software. Uh, they're not a one size fits all, but they're a template, something that we can at least start from uh, to, to implement in our uh, game here. Um, and on the right here, I have a few um, of the texts that um, I think are particularly good at uh, explaining design patterns um, going forward, uh, which I'll link at the end. So again, design pattern, it's a common repeatable solution for solving a problem. And ideally, design patterns make our code more flexible, maintainable, and uh, extensible. Here's the famous uh, gang of four book design patterns, uh, still relevant today. Um, and there's lots of nice code examples uh, in this text, so I would recommend that. Uh, and I also really enjoy this textbook. Um, it is freely available, but uh, I've purchased a copy because I think it was great uh, by uh, Robert Nystrom called Game Programming Patterns. Again, doesn't matter if you care about games or not. Uh, it does a nice job in the game domain uh, highlighting the different patterns. Okay, so what does the design patterns book give us? Well, again, these reusable templates. So specifically, it gives us 23 patterns for solving problems that tend to keep showing up in software. Okay, and then it's your job to sort of identify the right pattern that fits the problem that you're trying to solve. And today we're gonna focus on uh, creational patterns, and in fact, just uh, one specific uh, of these creational patterns here. Uh, 
okay? And what is a creational design pattern? So there's creational, structural, and behavioral. Uh, we're worried about creating things in our game, so we're gonna focus on that. So briefly, uh, in a slide, what I could say about creational design patterns is they provide a little bit of flexibility on how we create objects. And often they shield us or protect us from having to directly instantiate an object, uh, meaning we don't have to do uh, figure out what the type is, uh, allocate memory, you know, figure out what the right uh, allocator is here, new, and then the type here. And then even we can go as far as you know, picking the right constructor uh, for the user. Okay, so we sort of prefer this if we have an easy way uh, to construct our objects. Okay, so where we left off with this pattern here, uh, make object, where we were passing in an integer for the object type and some amount of parameters. Um, well, you know, this wasn't very good. We, we decided it didn't really meet our criteria here. Uh, so we do need to think a little bit more about our object type structure, because that's sort of interesting that we at least know we have different object types here. So just a quick uh, one slide refresh on object-oriented programming. Uh, something that's in our toolbox, so something that we have to decide whether it's a good tool or not for us to use is inheritance here. Right? So the sort of canonical uh, example here, if you have some base class that's an animal, you can drive a class or inherit from that class uh, and create something called dog, and a dog is a type of animal. And that's pretty cool for things like code reuse, but what it's really nice for is setting up this relationship to say that a dog is a type of animal. And in C++, that means we have this uh, polymorphism uh, or inheritance-based polymorphism, right? Where a dog can um, act like a, it is a animal. Okay, so we were close in solving our problem. Again, maybe if the deadline's tomorrow, uh, we are done, so we've solved it, but you know, we wanna do better here. So we wanna set up some sort of object um, inheritance uh, hierarchy here, okay? So, you know, this is going to be good for uh, two reasons. It's gonna help simplify us creating different objects, and it's also going to uh, help enforce what sort of properties those objects have. So, you know, I have a lot of these sort of virtual void. These are purely virtual functions, meaning that we have to implement them from any class that's derived from I game object here. Okay, so game object's just a general um, sort of uh, interface. Uh, and usually I prefix things with capital I to indicate that it's an interface or it's meant to be derived from. This is a base class. Um, note on my slide where all these examples are available. Some of them are not uh, always efficient. <laughs> but if you spot errors, I don't have any chocolate or anything to give to you, but I can figure out something. <laughs> so, um, you know, so we want some sort of inheritance hierarchy that maybe looks something like this. So we have our iGame object, and then we can drive our new objects, object type one from this iGame object, and well, really as many as we have. So here's the nth uh, game object that we have. Again, establishing this relationship, object type one is a iGame object, okay? So it's derived from this base class. Right, so what does that look like in code? I'm gonna be showing code. Again, these are functional examples. And well, uh, if I look at uh, the top left of the screen here, I have a class here. It says object type one, and it's gonna inherit from iGame object. Uh, this will actually uh, publicly um, inherit from it. I'll fix that in a slide for a moment. Uh, but we can see what's happening with object type one is it has to also implement all these other member functions. Object you know, play a default animation, move the object, update the object, uh, render or draw the object, uh, all these different behaviors that we want. Okay, so let's um, make this a subtle change, make this public inheritance, uh, so we get access to everything here. Uh, and another sort of subtle change, so I'm not talking about object one and object two, uh, we now have a plane and a boat. Uh, so we have two sort of uh, concrete objects here. Okay, and they're deriving from this I game object class. Okay, so let's go ahead and update uh, this function to 
uh, create objects. So what I have on the left is what I started with. Again, I was just making an object, passing in integers. We didn't like these parameters. Yeah, we could have maybe um, made some other data structures or changed it, but uh, we're gonna get rid of that and start taking advantage of uh, the inheritance uh, that we've created with this uh, hierarchy. So on the right side here, I have uh, a new function. It's called create object function, and it still takes in some sort of object type uh, O here. Okay, well, what is object type? That's a little bit of a relic uh, from our, our past. But if I go up here to line 38, I've actually got an enum class here where I'm trying to protect myself a little bit. So my object types here are plane and boat. So I have to pass in one of these, either object type colon colon plane or object type colon colon boat here. Um, so I sort of like that. That's better than the integer. And you know, folks can feel free to um, disagree if we've got uh, trade-offs, but that seems safer to me. Okay, I know exactly how many conditions I need to handle. Um, at least these two. You know, there um, I have a comment below that I'll, I should probably handle a default case um, as well, uh, but I at least have these two cases. Okay, so what is this uh, function actually doing? Create object factory. Well, it's returning a iGame object pointer. Okay. Um, so the job of this function is to figure out what type we have and then return that type in terms of a pointer here. Okay, uh, so then each of the cases, I return a new plane and I return a new boat. Okay, and I'm, I'm choosing the you know, explicit constructors that I want and how I want things initialized here. Okay, so again, just recapping, uh, I have this enum class that's gonna specify the different types of objects that I can pass here. Um, I could have also done this on the left side, that's true, I could incorporate some of these changes, but again, we're gonna have the uh, right type here. Then the second major change uh, that I have here is, in a way, I've simplified the function. Right now it's just a switch statement on the object type, and I'm just returning uh, the memory, so I'm allocating this on the heap, to some type of iGame object. And again, I can get away with this because a plane is an iGame object, a boat is an iGame object, uh, et cetera. And what's also interesting about this code here, I've called it create object factory, is we're sort of moving towards some of our solid principles. So the yes, where we have a single responsibility principle. Um, I won't claim that this is a uh, super concrete, but um, at least for now in this toy example, all of my object creation is now in this one function. Okay, and I sort of like that. There's one place to do that. And one more uh, small change here to keep up with the modern times, <laughs> just to sort of demonstrate. Um, and, and this is something you'll, you'll have to make a design decision about. For a game, I think it's appropriate, but I'm actually gonna return a shared pointer here um, because I, I wanna be a little bit careful with how I'm managing resources, um, but I'm gonna return this uh, shared pointer to a plane uh, or shared pointer to a boat um, and, and do that. Right? The pointer is gonna protect us, give us a little bit of um, protection in terms of uh, deallocating or freeing these resources, as well as you know objects and games, maybe they have something expensive um, associated with them, some you know pixel data, textures, you know, animations, or whatever. All right, so how am I using this in my main loop? Because I've got this handy function now where I can create uh, objects. So here's what my main loop looks like. And okay, one thing that's nicer is at line 55 I'm looking at, I just have this game object collection, which is just a collection of my shared pointers for iGame object here. Okay, so I sort of like that, just one collection to worry about. And C++ will take um, care of resolving, you know, which, um, what the actual uh, type is here. So now I can do game object collection, push back, uh, and then it's nested in this statement here. Create object factory, my name class, object type, colon, colon, plane. I do that three times and my boat. Okay, so now I've got this function where I'm creating things and pushing them into my uh, data structure here. Okay, so I sort of like that uh, layer of abstraction. That's becoming a little bit cleaner. And a side effect of this as well, uh, just the way that I've uh, structured this and used some uh, inheritance is 
Well, in my game loop, I can now just iterate through my entire game collection. Okay, so then I can just call you know, whatever this element is and update and render it. Okay, so that's sort of nice and clean. These are all game objects that implement these um, different uh, functionalities. Um, now, just a brief aside on this loop here. <laughs> this is for my, my experts in the audience. Um, you know, we probably want to refactor this code if we are thinking about things like performance, um, caching, how we're accessing these objects. Um, but for now, you know, that, that's a separate talk, and I think there's been several uh, good ones on that. Um, I will point you to the Game Programming uh, Patterns book, which, which talks a little bit about that, because um, I think this is a concern, but um, not the focus of this talk. Okay, what have we done here? Well, from the you know, title of the talk here, we know that this is about the factory uh, pattern here. Uh, and specifically, we've implemented what's called the factory method, uh, which is a creational uh, design pattern, right? So um, what is the factory method sort of defined? The factory method pattern provides a generalized way to create instances of an object and can be a great way to hide implementation details for derived classes, okay? Uh, so let me just kind of break that down. Um, so our ability to create instances of an object. Uh, yes, we can do that. Right? So we have our create object factory with the different object types. And you know, this is sort of a, a generalized way to do so, right? Just from this one uh, single function. And everything's an iGame object. Um, so I, I like that so far. And you know, we can even extend this a little bit to do some more wild things. So, you know, I don't have a different uh, type necessarily for a plane uh, in the air. So I've added to my Noom class here, plane underscore in air. And I can add a different case that instantiates a plane that's, well, if these are X and Y coordinates, maybe, you know, 100,000 means something um, as far as, you know, how high you are um, in the uh, coordinate system. Um, so, you know, we can kind of extend this and, and play around with this uh, example a little bit. Um, so again, I, I like that. Um, okay, so now I've added this plane and error condition, which, you know, calls the same constructor, but with different parameters, or, you know, something that we might commonly want to do in our game. So about this other point, though, the second part of the factory method, it says it's a great way to hide implementation details uh, for the derived class. Um, so this I haven't really talked about too much uh, in, in a sense that I'm uh, introducing it now, uh, but I did spend uh, a few minutes to refactor this code here. And what we're looking at here is the header file, or factory.hpp, and this is what I'm actually exposing to the client or somebody who's gonna use this in a game. So what they're gonna see is, okay, well I've included memory here, um, but I have a class, iGameObject, and that's, tends to be nice. Um, I don't need to include the whole uh, header file. I have my Noom class, uh, which, you know, we could hide that somewhere, but for now I'm gonna leave this um, to the client uh, just so they can see the, the types that they have here. So maybe that's something that could be improved on. Uh, but then they just see that we create an object uh, factory here. Okay, so that's kind of nice. There's no implementation details. I didn't have to uh, provide all the, the code necessarily. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm happy with this part of the pattern here. Okay, so no design pattern is perfect, though. Uh, and again, computer science is all about trade-offs. That's what I always tell uh, students. And this is another sort of audience question. Um, so what do we like about this? What are the, the pros? What are the cons? Are we happy with, with what we see here? Give folks a moment to think about it. Yeah, Jason. Our code has a hook in the software. Uh, implementation question is, when her Flutter presented on factory pattern in C++11 like a million years ago, mm -hmm. he recommended uh, returning a unique pointer from your factory so that then the consumer can decide if they want to pay the cost of putting in the shared pointer. And as in your examples, you're just returning shared pointers. So it's a true Flutter software. Yeah, so the question was, uh, Herb Stock, uh, probably many years ago, uh, 10 years or so ago, um, where, you know, shared pointer, unique pointer, and these kind of things were new. I could return std unique pointer here um, for my game object, and then, um, 
you know, then, then I have one pointer, and then it's my decision to make a, a copy of that object and, and put it in a shared pointer if I think it's uh, something resource intensive. Um, I think that's, that's absolutely reasonable. Um, in a game, you know, for us to default to the shared state case, maybe it just depends what we're doing. Um, so um, in a specific uh, game case, if we have a lot of things that are repeating, um, textures and some of these things, um, I guess we would need another level of abstraction where we're grabbing those things from a texture managing class or something and then just send those into a unique pointer for this object. So. Oh, there's no copy for the conversion from unique to, to shared? No, the only thing that it's just movable? Right, okay, yeah, that's probably more efficient. Uh, especially, you know, if we're using this create object factory, especially if it's something, uh, you know, think in games terms or a very dynamic application, there's lots of particles, or you're creating like hundreds or thousands of objects. I, I think that's a, a good default. So that's probably a, a better default. Yeah. Uh, yeah, come in. Uh, one thing that uh, we lose in this particular implementation is the ability to provide parameters. So in the original implementation, you could customize how the objects were created. Yeah, so we've. Uh, the, the comment was you know, previously we were able to pass in parameters, and that could be powerful in a sense of um, the. Uh, different types that we could maybe create. Um, that, that almost leads me to other uh, creational patterns, things like the builder pattern and some of these things, um, which would be another uh, talk, but, but that's the keyword. Um, so yeah, we, we could have that, right? We did sort of this hacky thing where I have plain underscore in air and said, okay, that's another type and I'll special case it here. So that's a trade-off, maybe that's okay, but I would say if we, if we do it more than once and, and we don't, and you know, uh, we're, we're documenting this, we probably want to fix that, right? We, we can add some more power to our uh, factories here, right? This is just a single method, so we will add some more power uh, momentarily. Um, any, any thoughts? Does anyone want to give a, a check mark or a yay or nay for flexible? Okay, so, so uh, some loss in flexibility since we can't pass in the parameters. Okay, so the, the comment was for maintainability, small number of objects, probably okay to have our uh, switch cases here. Uh, so this is where the nuance comes. If we have a, a thousand objects and I have to have cases for each of them, uh, maybe not optimal. Yeah, and extensibility, can we add new types here? I get a thumbs up for this one. Okay, so that one passes uh, and we got some cons. Uh-oh, let's see, what, what did I commit to on the next slide? as pros and cons. <laughs> so uh, I bailed myself out here. Flexible, relatively flexible. <laughs> okay, so, so we can sort of run with this, um, right? We lost our parameters. Maybe we're gonna end up creating a lot of uh, different types. Uh, maybe we want some other pattern combined with the factory. Uh, and what I will say is the factory tends to be one that gets combined with other patterns. So maybe it's in a singleton that you find a, a factory, or maybe it's used in conjunction with a builder to build many different types. Um, so I think we, we could improve on this. Um, the maintainability, uh, we have one update to the Noom class and one update to the switch statement. That's not too bad. Um, you know, maybe, maybe that's okay. Maybe we can do this in a more data-driven uh, manner, which is uh, where I'm gonna move us uh, momentarily. Uh, and the extensibility, creating new objects is pretty easy through inheritance, right? We just, uh, inherit from a, a base class, we like that. Um, some of the cons though, you know, we might need several different factories for different hierarchies. Uh, so we do have to think a little bit about that and how we might abstract that. That's actually gonna be a, a, another pattern uh, that I'll mention. And I still don't like updating in two places. It's okay, um, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it's, you know, we, we've gotta judge what our code base is here. Um, and um, to the comment below, I have, you should probably think more about if you wanna use shared pointer or unique pointer. <laughs> so um, I've covered myself in, in some way, um, but that is something that we do need to think about. Um, so some other just neat ideas with this pattern though is we can make our application more uh, data-driven uh, with this pattern. I think it's a little bit easier. 
Um, so what I'm showing here, I'll draw your attention to the bottom left corner. I've got this file I just call level1.txt, and I've just got a listing of the different types of objects we might want to create. A plane, a boat, a plane in the air. Uh, so that's sort of our configuration. And on the right side, again, we don't really need to read the code, but I've got my uh, game object collection. And I'm just going to read from this file, and if the line equals equals plane, well, then I call you know, the game object collection, push back, and then uh, set up my factory to make a call to make that plane. Okay, so I sort of like that data-driven approach. I don't have to recompile. Again, if you're working on a team that's not all engineers and uh, maybe a um, artist or a game designer just has to work in this configuration file to test out different things, um, that's, that's usually a, a good decision um, if, if we're willing to pay a little bit of cost to just read in the data here. Uh, the other sort of uh, neat idea or thing that we can get uh, from this pattern a little bit more easy is sort of tracking our object counts. Um, now this is one I could imagine doing a number of ways. I've taken uh, what I think is maybe the, the easiest, where in each of our classes, like plane, uh, you have some static that just counts the objects created. Okay, so you know, we could have other manager classes or you know, iterate through our collection if we want, but you know, we're, we're doing a little bit of information gathering here, and I think that's sort of nice, um, and uh, just, just containing it, okay? Um, so, you know, looking back to our earlier question, you know, how well do you think I, as a developer, can predict at compile time what objects to create? Well, in a game, you might exactly know, actually, um, depending on uh, what's going on, right? And there's systems for sort of recycling objects and stuff, but you could let somebody play, see how many objects are created, and, and gather some metrics here. Okay, so this, this pattern could, could help with that. All right, but let's focus on making our pattern a little bit more extensible here. And this is a pattern, uh, it's called the Extensible uh, Factory from uh, Alex Andrescu, um, who wrote about it in Modern C++ Design. Uh, and I'm basing my example based off of uh, Martin uh, Reddy's API Design for C++ book, um, which is a really great book for picking up patterns and, and good practices in C++, uh, in my opinion. Okay, so our goal uh, with this pattern is to allow us at runtime to create new types. So we figured out you know, that we can make our application a little bit data-driven by reading in from a text file the things we want to create. But what if a user says, hey, I want to create my own type, um, or we want to um, you know, add different objects? So what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to create something called my game object factory. Okay, this time I'm going to package things together into a, a class here. And my class has all static member functions for now. Uh, I want to keep things simple. It's essentially a singleton, so depending on how you feel about that, <laughs> um, you might have uh, comments. But um, let me draw you to the uh, key components with this uh, extensible factor, or why, or why I'm going to argue it's a little bit more extensible. So there's really two key functions that have been uh, added here. And it's our ability to register or unregister object types. So this means that we're going to be adding the types of objects that we want this specific factory to be able to create. So how do we do that? Well, let me give us a, a brief sort of walkthrough of the code in words, and then you're uh, free to check it out. Uh, but we have this register object um, member function. It's a static void, so we can you know, call it from wherever. And we're gonna figure out our, our type here or name our type here, okay? So this could be plane, this could be boat, this could be plane in the air. Um, I'm gonna create one later called ant, because I was just thinking of something new. And the second parameter is this create object callback. And what this is, well, it's a little bit subtle, but at line 17, I've done a type definition. This callback function is going to tell us how do we create whatever this type is. Okay, so we're gonna pass that in. Every time we register an object, we're gonna give it a name, and then we're gonna say, okay, when I wanna create this type of object, what function do you call? Okay, and then I'm gonna store that in a map. Okay, so I have this uh, S underscore, I like using S as a prefix when I have a static variable. Uh, objects, that's our uh, collection. The type, that's how we refer to things, a plane, a boat, uh, ants, whatever, and then the callback function that's gonna create that object. 
Okay, so then at the bottom of the screen, you can see where my uh, map is uh, as well. And I've uh, used a type def here um, within this scope to just make it a little bit cleaner so I don't have to type out string and then you know whatever the create object callback is, which is just a function that returns a pointer to whatever that object is. Okay, so again, this is the uh, important part. So if we're trying to make it an extensible software and we want some sort of uh, plug-in system, for instance, where a user can come and later modify our uh, code, it's really this register uh, object function that's uh, important. So if you've ever written any uh, software that has a plug-in system or whatever, um, this might be a, a pattern that they're using. And as far as our factory goes, it's almost uh, the same. Uh, so I've got this create single uh, object here, and I just pass in the uh, type here. And when I pass in the type, well, how do I figure out if that's a type that we can construct? Well, I've got an iterator here, and I've got to iterate through all my types and construct it, okay? Um, so maybe there's uh, better ways to do this. Maybe we can use some um, random access uh, data structure, um, you know, to, to improve on this. But um, you know, this this is okay. And then we'll call the appropriate uh, callback function. So let me show you what that looks like um, in a moment, uh, which is right here. Where so how do we uh, create our previous types? So to the right, what I'm looking at here at line 34 and 35, I have my game object factory colon colon register objects. I'm calling that static function. Uh, what I'm going to uh, call it, plane here, and then I have plane colon colon create. Okay, and that's my callback function. Uh, so we don't know what this is. We haven't seen this yet, so let me um, reveal that. And the rest of this code's the same. Um, and I've got a little reader exercise here for, for folks who want to implement this, but you have it for plane. Uh, but here's the uh, new type that I want to add. Okay, so uh, I called it ant, uh, like ants, the insects that <laughs> walk on the ground, um, and or or everywhere in your house or uh, wherever. Um, but this is going to inherit from I game object. Same same thing um, as before. What's different, or what I want to draw your attention to, is line twenty three through twenty five. I have a static function here. It returns an I game uh, object, a pointer to one. Um, so again, you can choose smart pointer, unique pointer, or in this case, just a raw pointer, and a create function. And if you'll see, this just returns a new ant. So that's where our object creation is being done. And then we can call this static uh, function here, create, for our new type, uh, which is demonstrated here on the right side. Okay, so that's pretty cool. I, I've, I appreciate this, this pattern here. Okay, now, one thing um, I want to think about, and we'll do a little bit of, um, actually, well, I've got the code here. I'm going to ask this again, but what do folks think about this extensive uh, factory here? Better, worse than just having the, the free function? I see a couple head nods. Better, most, most people are saying better. So if, if this is something we need, if we need our users or the ability to create uh, new types while the program's running or, or configure, um, probably better. Uh, we've got a question from online. Yeah, the question is, um, why don't we use unordered map for callback map? Uh, so the question is, why don't we use unordered map? Um, we, we certainly could use it here. Um, that would probably give us O of 1 uh, access, and um, that would be fine. Yeah. All right. OK, so we're, we're mostly happy with that pattern. Uh, so is the pattern actually used? Because uh, sometimes you know we look at some of these things and we say, well, uh, it's cool to think about theoretically or you know academically or whatever, uh, but is it used? So what I did was I downloaded a bunch of open source programs and I just grepped for uh, factory <laughs> to see if I could find the class. So uh, one, this is a tip, you know, name your objects well <laughs> so that people can find them. Uh, but where did I find this? So I just looked in a few projects. Um, so this is a game or graphics engine. It's open source, Horde 3D. Um, it has a factory uh, pattern. And, you know, you don't have to look through the listings, but they use it for their uh, plugin system. I see a plugin system down here, and they're creating a, a node factory. In fact, they have many different factories. Okay, so I see it again in uh, Ogre, which is the object-oriented uh, graphics rendering engine. So it's there. I see it in Blender 3D, another popular uh, program. So it's used all over the place, uh, factory. 
I saw it in Quake 3 Arena. So pretty much every, I was getting hits on pretty much every sort of uh, C++ uh, project to see this factor in use, which was pretty cool. And I think that might be a um, sort of going further exercise from this talk to, to look at one of these uh, repositories. They're all linked here, they're all open source, so you can see in practice if they're uh, doing anything different. Um, and then of course, you know, it better be in the game that I'm uh, showing all the time, <laughs> Command and Conquer here. Um, so it is in the uh, Command and Conquer Remastered uh, Edition. Uh, now, now be careful because there's a literal uh, factory in the game, but they use the factory uh, path, uh, pattern in it as well. Uh, so you can see uh, the factory uh, class here. Um, so if you want to actually see for that particular game, it sort of makes sense that they're uh, trying to do something with inheritance. These are the actual uh, game objects and the buildings and you know that they've charted out. So it makes sense that they're making use of uh, object-oriented behavior. So that's another uh, way to think about maybe design patterns. If you can draw your program out and see you know, is this a candidate for an inheritance-based data structure? Is there too much, too little? Um, something to think about. Um, and then I do have a note here. Um, Jason Turner did a um, source review of the Command and Conquer um, code, which I thought was really interesting, uh, which, which may help uh, give some insights here. Um, so again, no design patterns perfect. So just a little, you know, recap. You know, we can't hide lots of our implementation details. Um, you know, we only really need to know the type of the thing that we want to create. Sometimes that's a string or, or maybe an enum class. Um, and, you know, these can be relatively uh, extensible, as I've done in the extensible uh, factory. Uh, maybe on the con side, you know, we still need to document how to create types. That's probably useful to our uh, clients. Maybe that's in text documentation or, or maybe in your actual factory class. You have a little printout that says, okay, these are all the types in my uh, map. Um, you know, that, that could be a, a useful thing for your users. And, you know, something to always think about, I don't have any empirical evidence with me, but, you know, if we're using lots of inheritance, would that cause performance issues? Maybe, maybe not. Something we have to think about, um, we have to test, right, um, to, to see if um, some of these um, virtual calls can get optimized away um, and so on. All right, so um, a few last notes as we're wrapping up. Um, and this is one I've got to be careful and say, Mike, careful calling it the factory uh, pattern, because this is uh, typically called, uh, what I showed at least in the first part of the, the talk, the factory uh, method pattern, right? It was just a, a free function that was uh, standing alone. Um, that said, there are lots of different factory patterns. There's an abstract factory, the extensible factory, which we looked at, distributed factories, um, many other variations, I'm sure. Um, so those will be the keywords if you want to say, well, this isn't quite what I want, but I know I want to create objects. Um, so just going forward. So quick uh, conclusion, what we've learned, we've learned about the factory uh, method pattern, uh, a little bit about the pros and cons, and again, thinking about our design pattern. Uh, we took it a little bit further by talking about the extensible uh, factory pattern for how we could create maybe a plugin system or make our application a little bit more uh, data or user driven. Uh, we didn't talk about creating multiple factories. There could have been a few ways to do this, right? We could have um, this last extensible factory pattern, for instance, I could have made that templated. Um, that could be one way to sort of choose which factory you want. Um, but there are other sort of patterns like the um, abstract factory pattern where you have a bunch of interfaces um, for each of the concrete objects that you uh, want to do and then sort of another factory sitting on top of that. Um, so those are some other um, things to think about or, or what you might want to learn next. All right, so going further, uh, just a few notes, some videos, resources that might be helpful. Uh, these were the, the three books that I was uh, skimming while I was uh, writing this talk. There's been um, you know, I've listed a few CppCon talks here, and honestly, there's been so many that I just put in YouTube, CppCon plus design patterns. <laughs> and you'll find many, whether related to, you know, specific gang of four uh, design patterns, concurrency patterns, uh, or so on. All right, code for the talk is available. All the code should compile, uh, so feel free to uh, play around with it. And uh, thank you for everybody's uh, time and attention. I'll be happy to uh, take questions. A question, yeah. So one of the problems I can potentially see with this is that it groups everything all together, right? So don't create an object, it is a point about whatever, here's your collection of everything. 
But then I can, of course, see, oh, I want to make all my planes fly around. So I'm, I'm going to go through that collection and say, oh, find if it's a plane, I'll make another collection. It's kind of like, here's all my objects. Oh, wait, they all behave differently, so I have to do something differently. Is there something that can kind of mitigate that? Basically, uh, you've made your beautiful collection of everything. Oh, wait, they're individual things, and I need to do individual things on. Yeah, so to repeat the, the question, if I understand it, we've got all of our creation going on, and let's just maybe put one of the code snippets um, up here. Um, in whether it's the uh, extensible factory or even the, um, the factory method pattern, right? It's all in one place, but these objects might behave differently. Um, so one thing to think about is, I, I guess, if we truly have different behaviors for objects, should they be in the same sort of inheritance hierarchy? We, we probably want to push them out somewhere else. So this is where we probably have multiple uh, factories. So you know, a quick way to adjust it or a quick uh, hack would be to you know just make this class templated. And then I have one for the i game object, one for you know uh, buildings or something that's significantly different and would have a different behavior. Um, now there are other patterns where if you just really wanted to have everything in one place um, because you have some reason or restriction or, or it's a small enough project, um, we could create objects that have different um, behaviors. The one that comes to mind um, in the game programming patterns book is called the type uh, object pattern, where you can sort of construct objects. Um, it, it's like a, a builder sort of pattern where you can add sort of functionality as you need or, or some behavior. Um, Actually, I'd be even careful with the, the builder pattern because usually that's sort of the same, like, you know, you're building a car, but is it a, a Ford or is it a Tesla, but they're still cars. Um, but the type object pattern is one that maybe is useful. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think one potential thing to consider with this pattern is, uh, particularly in this slide, we've implicitly coupled all of these types together. Yeah. We've required that they have the same create type method. It's some method that uh, satisfies that particular uh, API, I guess, but it's implicit. There's no way to see uh, that it's there when you're creating the, the new object. Yeah, so the comment was about um, all these objects have a uh, create um, function for how we're creating it. They're all, uh, I guess, created in the same way, and we can't uh, parameterize them. Is that a fair uh, saying? Well, they're coupled in the sense that they have to match, but it's implicit because there's, it's not like an interface where uh, you, you get the uh, warning that you're not implementing a required method. Right, right. OK, yeah, so the comment is about, um, you know, there, uh, I mean, we, we have coupling going on here. Uh, usually we don't, uh, we try to decouple, yeah. Um, uh, question uh, online and then in the front. Are Lambda functions an option for object creation? In this example, instead of setting up a condition chain like if or switch, perhaps passing in Lambda function to create specific objects. Uh, pardon, I missed the uh, first part of the question. Um, was it about inline functions? Are Lambda functions an option for object creation? Uh, pardon the first part. Lambda function. Oh, Lambda, lambda functions uh, for creation. Yeah, so you know, I would probably model this right. I could create a uh, std function here and pass in you know something callable. Um, let me think about lambdas though. As long as I'm returning some object uh, that's been created, um, I think that's okay. Um, maybe that's a, a clean way. That maybe that's another extensible way to sort of create types on the fly or um, register them. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the, the comment was about um, if we're returning uh, iGame object and this is an interface, um, do we have to implement everything? I, th I think is what we're thinking about. Yeah. And then the, the question was, is, can we play around this uh, with this as a context for context instead of like the name information and all that to register other you know, compile uh, The comment was about using a const expert to see if it would register everything during compile time. I actually haven't uh, played around with it. Um, that's a great experiment, though, to see if it'll uh, register. Good, good performance hack. Uh, 
another uh, online question. Do you have any guidelines on how this could be applied without using inheritance? Without using inheritance. Um, for the factory, yeah, I, I mean, I think, um, so how would I implement this pattern without using inheritance? I mean, so our other sort of object-oriented tools are you know, using composition to, um, this is another, um, I'm blanking on the, the name, let me put the book in front of me here, uh, on the Game Programming Patterns book um, that has a few nice patterns where basically you can construct objects, um, read in some configuration file and you're, um, I, I, I don't know if this is the heart of the question, but if you're talking about some sort of component system, because um, that's sort of our other tool, right? Without inheritance, we can use composition to maybe create a different uh, object or something with a different uh, behavior. Um, so that's something to think about. Um, so I believe the time's up for the session. I'll be in the speaker room and happy to talk with anyone who has questions afterward. Thank you again.